When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my dear friends, and welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and it's felt like an eternity since I was with you last. I mean, I know it's only been a week, but man, I wanted this week to fly by. Because we had to talk about crucifixion last week. We get to talk about resurrection this time. And I just want, I, I want to fly past Friday and get to Sunday as quickly as we can. Because Friday's hard. Studying the crucifixion is, it's a heavy, heavy topic. The weight of the cross is crushing. It was for Jesus. It is for us too. And sometimes I wish there were a Simon out there just to take it away and bear it for me. But there is also value, as Jacob said, in viewing Christ's death. And I pray last week's lesson was a blessing to you. Did you make it through it? I don't mean physically, like it was a long lesson. I know that. But emotionally and spiritually, did you make it through that lesson? Did you come to more fully appreciate all that was weighing on Jesus as he hung from the cross? Did you come to see the significance of those final seven sayings? Especially the last one, it is finished. And what was finished? His preparations under the children of men. I pray that last week swelled our hearts as wide as eternity, just like it did for Jesus. But I'll admit, it's, it's a hard one. I want to, to fly past Friday and get to Sunday as quickly as I can. Uh, in the New Testament, we, can, we even get the, the luxury of skipping over Saturday. Two years ago in the Doctrine and Covenants, we studied what happened on that Saturday. On my mission, when I learned the Holy Week days in Spanish, it was Sabado de Gloria. And it was a Saturday of glory because of what Jesus did then. It was the Sabbath for his followers. And so they would have rested that day. Though, as I mentioned last week, I doubt it was very restful for them. As they were just anxious and eager to get past the day so they could rush back to the sepulcher and continue caring for the body of Christ. But while they were, quote unquote, resting that day, Jesus wasn't. It was a work and Sabbath for him. And the work of redemption is what he was extending to the hosts of the spirits in prison, organizing the righteous to preach deliverance to the captives, which they did. Oh, a glorious Saturday indeed. But you want to talk about glory. Then you turn the page and come to Easter morning. And to finally be here, the last chapters of each gospel Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20 and 21. The, this is more than crescendo. It's climax. It is grand finale. It is the symbol crash at the end of a spiritual symphony. And to be able to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we get to do this week. And there's no better way to end the Gospels. It's the exclamation point at the end of the good news. And it's a, a reminder that the good news doesn't end. It's just a new beginning. Starting next week, we'll be in the second half of our New Testament study for this year. And it's incredible. The Acts of the Apostles, oh, prepare yourself to be blown away by their power. To turn to the epistles of Paul. And yes, they're hard to understand. They're tricky at times, but it's so worth the effort to understand them. And then the epistles of Peter and James and John, the, the book of Revelation, well, with all of its glorious symbolism. The second half of our year is amazing, but there's no better way to end the first half than what we'll see today. I actually want to read a hymn to give our kind of closing notes on, on what we studied last week so that we can then turn the page to the resurrection for this week. Uh, there is a hymn that I absolutely love. It sounds so old, and yet it was written 
in the 20th century. Karen Lynn Davidson wrote the lyrics to O Savior Thou Who Wearest a Crown. And perhaps it sounds so much older than it is because the music is that old. The music comes from the 16th century and then was reworked by Bach in the 18th century. This is, this is old music. But to hear the sound of what Jesus went through, listen to this. And let it be a review of all we studied last week. O oh, Savior, thou who wearest a crown of piercing thorn, the pain thou meekly bearest, weighed down by grief and scorn, the soldiers mock and flail thee, for drink they give thee gall, upon the cross they nail thee to die, O King of all. No creature is so lowly, no sinner so depraved, but feels thy presence holy, and through thy love is saved. Though craven friends betray thee, they feel thy love's embrace. The very foes who slay thee have access to thy grace. Thy sacrifice transcended the mortal law's demand. Thy mercy is extended to every time and land. No more can Satan harm us, though long the fight may be nor fear of death alarm us. We live, O Lord, through thee. What praises can we offer to thank thee, Lord Most High? In our place thou didst suffer, in our place thou didst die. By heaven's plan appointed to ransom us our King, O Jesus the Anointed, to thee our love we bring. Did those lyrics bring lessons back to remembrance of him taking our place, of him forgiving his persecutors, of him, of his grace, even being accessible to those who betrayed him? There are so many lessons in those lyrics that are moving to me. And yet to turn the page, and if that is a crucifixion hymn, to have the three resurrection hymns that follow, <laughs> they're three of the most glorious songs we can sing. The first one in our hymn book is That Easter Morn. Sadly, we don't seem to sing it as often. But musically, it teaches a lesson that is profound. The song itself is written in the minor, a minor key. And minor is, is a sorrowful sound. It's melancholy as the crucifixion would have been to all who witnessed it. But as each verse comes to an end with a long drawn out note, in the first verse it's minor, in the second it's minor, in the third it starts minor. But the song ends with this glorious resolution as the minor note is swallowed up into a major chord. It, that, that musically it's it's painting a picture of what's happening as we shift from crucifixion to resurrection. Musically, it ends on such a magnificent note, literally. But yes, Christ has conquered pain and conquered death and conquered fear. So no melancholy minor key is needed. The next two songs are He is Risen and Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Incredibly famous, well-loved songs. We sing those every Easter. I remember myself at one point, I was in a Methodist chapel uh, together with a bunch of church education colleagues. And Methodism was founded by John Wesley and his musically talented brother, Charles. And in that chapel with beautiful stained glass windows, we sang, Christ the Lord is Risen Today which was one of Charles Wesley's creations. So to do it in a place that he would have called home or could have was incredible. But I remember being so moved by the spirit of what we were singing about, rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. I, I sing bass 
And I love the bass line of this. Uh, Charles must have had a good eye to, to, to bass singers. Uh, and instead of giving all the glorious notes to the tenors, there's just a lot of movement in the bass line that's absolutely glorious. And so I was singing the bass line like I normally do and loving it until I got to a point where I just realized such gratitude for the resurrection was welling up within me that the bass line seemed too low and I couldn't belt it out. Uh, it's what Alma said, I cannot say what the least of what I feel. And I was feeling something beyond what the bass line would allow me to express. The, ch the challenge with the, the melody is it goes so high for us basses. But I, I kicked into that higher gear and I turned to soprano for a moment just because I wanted to sing at the top of my, not just the top of my range, it was a little beyond that, but the top of my voice. The, I'd never had that experience before of just trying to be moved into a higher register of the music. But that's the glory of the resurrection. I pray that the Holy Ghost will, out, will give us notes to sing today. And that we'll, we, we will see this this climactic end of the Gospels of Jesus Christ as the best possible news that we can sing to a weary world. I remember on my mission, last thing I'll say before we dive into the text itself, on my mission was I went to a Catholic church and I was first introduced to the Stations of the Cross. It's a beautiful way of kind of contemplatively, kind of mindfully working your way through the last day of the Savior's life. And there were 14 stations that begin with Christ's final condemnation. You are going to be executed now. And now take the cross. And then ends on the 14th station where his body is laid in the tomb. The sepulcher of Joseph of Arimathea. Most of those 14 stations are based on biblical texts. Although there are a few that are extra biblical. Some poetic license perhaps as Jesus fell and then fell again and fell again and different things happening between those. But I remember as a, I, mean, I was 19 years old, I didn't understand and didn't fully appreciate what Catholicism was trying to do in presenting those 14 stations. The, the focus for those was on the Savior's last moments. They were the stations of the cross, after all. But I remember getting to the 14th and honestly thinking, Wait, wait, wait. You can't stop here. You, you cannot stop here. That what, please add a 15th station. I was left with such a longing to turn the page and get to resurrection morn. And the last place I want to stay is just outside a tomb that I know still bears the body of Jesus. Please get to the 15th station. A, few, a year later, when I got, after I got home and was a student studying abroad in Israel, you can walk through the 14 stations. It's called the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain or the way of suffering. And it's as close as we can recreate the path that Jesus would have walked from Pilate to the, to the cross, to Calvary. And again, I just felt this, can we please, don't end it at Calvary. We've got to get to the garden tomb where we can rejoice in its emptiness, which brings a fullness of joy. I am grateful that we get to turn the page today and rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus. I testify that he lives. And pray that the Holy Ghost will help us live in him as we study these words today. We'll start with the Matthew account in chapter 28, which begins in the end of the Sabbath. As it began to dawn, John says it was yet dark. So the sun hasn't even begun to poke up over the horizon. But as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now the way this is set up chronologically is so beautiful. It's the end of the Sabbath. It's the day of rest is now over. It's time to work. 
And it's a glorious work and a wonder that's about to, to move forward. A work of resurrection, a work of extending the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it, yes, it's the end of the Sabbath. And it's beginning to dawn. Darkness is being replaced by glorious light. The sun, S-U-N, is beginning to rise, but the sun, S-O-N, has risen already. Now, Mark's version of this, chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, is similar, but notice a few added details. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now think about that. Anoint him. How do you say the anointed one in Hebrew? Mashiach. How do you say that in English? Messiah. How do you say the anointed one in Greek? Christos. How do you say that in English? Christ. And so even post-mortal ministry, even in death, Jesus remains the anointed one. And these incredible sister saints, these wonderful women, have come to re-anoint him, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, this holy Messiah. Now, it's very early in the morning, Mark tells us, the first day of the week. And they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And like I said, not just at the rising of the S-U-N, but for the rising of the S-O-N. Little do they know what, to, what awaits them once they arrive. Now Mark goes on, verse 3, They said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? I mean, theirs was purely a logistical question. Remember last week, this concern about, well, what if the, the, the Jewish leaders, anyway, they had this concern. What would happen if the apostles or the disciples come and, and whisk away the body of Jesus and then trump up some story that he'd, been, that he'd risen from the grave? Oh, the end of that would be worse than the beginning of all of this. So let's put a heavy stone over the door that no one will be able to move. Let's set watchmen, soldiers standing sentinel to make sure no one can, can open the grave. <laughs> well, good luck with that. And yet there's something powerful about this question in their mind. Who will roll away the stone for us? because we'll be unable to do so for ourselves. What obstacles do you perceive between you and the Savior? What lies between you and keeps you from fully coming unto Christ? Because does it leave you wondering, how can I possibly roll this stone away? Maybe yours is a stone of sin. Maybe yours is a a boulder of affliction. Maybe it's rubble of tribulation and adversity. Maybe it's a rock of doubt that you just can't get around. And how can I come into Christ when this obstacle stands in my way and there's no way to get around it and no one to move it aside? These are questions we all need to be wondering so that we can find solutions to that problem. How do I roll away the stone and come unto Christ as I need to? And yet the miracle. When they looked, they finally arrived there with this question on their mind. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great, too great for them to move. Who could have done this? They don't know yet, but they know that the obstacle is no longer there. And what I love about the thought of coming unto Christ and being so overwhelmed with worry that I'm not going to be able to get there because of these things that stand in my way. By the time you get there, miraculously, the obstacle isn't there in the way you expected it to be. How am I going to overcome this addiction? Just start the process of change. Just come unto Christ. Have faith that things will that a door will open, that a stone will roll. How will I be able to overcome the doubts that I feel when faith seems to be evaporating? Well, just start the process. 
have no more but a desire to believe. But let that desire work in you. Start to come unto Christ. And in the process, I mean, it's still dark out. And yet as you come, the light begins to, to rise. The dawn begins to break. Elder Packer used to talk about this, that if you'll have the faith to step into the darkness, the light will follow. If you'll come to the tomb, even in the dark hours, by the time you arrive, the sun will have risen. Don't worry about the stones in your way. Just start moving forward. And you will find that they have miraculously been rolled away by the time it's, you're ready to come unto Christ. One other thing I love about this, and I talked about this last year in our Old Testament study. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? And what we saw about the Savior there? That for all intents and purposes, Daniel was not supposed to survive that night. The den, for the lions it was the den. For Daniel it was a tomb. And he was not supposed to re-emerge. Now to keep the lions from, from escaping, uh, let alone the, the victims of their cruelty, they would roll a stone over the mouth of the lion's den. And yet what happened the next morning as the king comes rushing, hoping for a miracle, he has a stone rolled away and he that was supposed to be dead came forth alive again. Such a beautiful preview of what would happen this Easter morn. But that's what's happening. Now, in the Matthew account, jump back to chapter 28. See in verse 2 through 4, Behold, there was a great earthquake. Remember there had been an earthquake at his death? Now an earthquake before his resurrection. I mean, the earth itself is opening its doors, both to receive Christ and then to release him. And it wasn't just the earth doing it. Keep reading, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, in the JST of this, it says there were two angels. But to, to picture them both having come and rolling the stone away and then sitting on it as if to say, nobody's moving it back. Oh, yeah, yeah, I dare you to come. <laughs> okay, try it. Try to seal back the, uh, up that space. Try to block people from coming unto Christ or block Christ from coming back to life to come unto them. No, this, this stone is, is done. The, the, the earth has opened, the veil has parted, the stone has been rolled away. Now these angels, it says, their countenance was like lightning. Their raiment was white as snow. Does it ring any bells from the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus looked that way? But to think of lightning this brilliant flash of electrifying light. Oh, the light of the world is shining again. The white snow, that purity, blanketing the earth with peace. These are such beautiful images of what the resurrection entails. And then the next verse, for fear of him, for fear of these angels, Keepers did shake and became as dead men, which is interesting. These keepers, these are, we'll find out later, they're soldiers. And yet they're quaking in their boots. It's not just the earth is quaking, they are quaking too. And they're quaking all the way back to town with tail between their legs. They become as dead men. Think about that role reversal where they, the living, have now become as dead. Why? Because the dead has now returned as living. Now, what is, what's going to become of these, these watchmen, the Jewish leaders that were so concerned about keeping any kind of rumors at bay? Guard the tomb. Make sure nothing happens at the sepulcher. Well, these, these watchmen didn't stay and watch for long. Now, back to Mark. I know we're swinging back and forth, but to bring these two accounts together, Mark 16, verse 5. Entering into the sepulcher, these are these women that have come, right? Entering in, they saw a young man. Now, the JST says there were two young men. So these two angels, the law of witnesses, <laughs> bearing testimony that he had risen. There they are, sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garments. 
and they, the women, were affrighted. Now, the angel says to them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, the place where they laid him. Come take a look. It is an empty tomb. Believe me, the body is no longer present. Why? Because he's risen. Now, what I love about the way these angels said it, though, first of all, it was this reassurance and this encouragement. No need to fear. Be not affrighted. I know why you're here. You're seeking Jesus, and there's nothing to fear because he's not here. He is risen. Come look and, and see for yourself. But take those two phrases that are juxtaposed and, and isolate them. And I love what the, what the angels are hinting at. Be not affrighted. Why? Next phrase. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth. And honestly, as long as the second half of that statement is true, then the first half will always be true as well. If we are seeking Jesus, then there's nothing to fear. Once we have found him, we will have found everything else we need in life. And so as long as that's our goal, that's the object of our search, then no need to fear anything. He's conquered death. Death seems to be the one thing people fear most. Oh, it's the fear of the unknown on the other side. Well, now you know what's on the other side. And who is on the other side? It's him. Him, he who had conquered death and given us all the victory. So no fear. Keep searching for him. You'll find him and find all you need. In the Matthew version, verse 6, it says the same thing, but the flow of language is even more famous. He is not here, for he is risen. And in these beautiful three words, as he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. You catch that addition? He said it would be this way. He promised, and he keeps his promises. So often earlier in the Gospels, he had reassured them, yes, I'm going to Jerusalem, where I'll be betrayed into the hands of sinners and crucified, but I will rise the third day. That's not a parable. That's not figurative. It's going to happen. Plan on it. And this is happening just as he said. It's going to be as wonderful as he promised. Hold out hope for that. Years ago, Elder Joseph B. Worthland of the Quorum of the Twelve gave an amazing conference talk called Sunday Will Come. And he talked about the devastation of that Friday of crucifixion, but promised us all that no matter how dark our Fridays become, Sunday will always arrive and with a glorious dawn. And that's what's being promised them here. As he said, Sunday has come. Now, Luke's version of all of this is similar to Matthew and Mark, but there's a heightened oh, drama here, this sense of anticipation. The suspense is increased in Luke, at least in the King James Version of it. It says, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in. Still no talk of angels, okay? Just, just an open door, right? The, the hole in the rock is exposed. The stone's been rolled away. And they're there scratching their head, wondering what's going on. They enter in. They found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, can you picture them just worried and wondering? Keep reading. It came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then comes the message from the angels. Now, the JST clarifies all that and, and makes the Luke account much more parallel to the, the Matthew and Mark. So in the JST, the angels are already there. And they come and they see the open door, but they see the angels and, and they're shocked by it all and perplexed, but then the angels explain themselves. But I do love the King James Version just because, I mean, the JST, if, that, if that's the, the accurate chronology, fine. But... The King James Version does seem to be more true to my own experience, where I don't understand. It, I, it's this mix of, of confusion and curiosity. It is this perplexity of not knowing where I am and what's going on, and where's Jesus in all of this when I thought I'd find him here, and I'm doing all these things, but I, I don't know what's happening. And it's only by poking my head in 
by, by coming in the dark and hoping the light will come. By wondering about the stone, but coming nonetheless. By not knowing in advance any of these things, but having the faith to at least come and see. And it's then that the explanation arrives. It's then that the angels appear. It's then that the light dawns on me and things start to make sense. I pray that we can get past our perplexity and push beyond our confusion and our astonishment and our fear. Because faith precedes the miracle and we receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. The faith of these women is it's being tried and they're, they're passing their test in glorious ways. The Luke version continues in verse 5, as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they, the angels, said unto them, the women, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Oh, yeah. And they remembered his words. Do you see the light bulb above their heads? He did say that, didn't he? And I guess he was speaking literally. Of all the times not to take his words literally. We've been guilty of that so many times when he was being figurative. We get, we get him wrong in both directions. He did say he would rise again. And you mean to tell me he has? This is such an incredible fulfillment of the promises of the Lord. And, and they're remembering it would be this way. You see, to me, I, again, I can't blame them. Because resurrection has never happened before, okay? Uh, Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept, as Paul will say. And so resurrection, what does that even mean? Rise again the third day. I mean, yes, we saw Jesus raise the daughter of Jairus. And we saw him raise the son of the widow of Nain. And we saw him raise, the, raise, raise Lazarus from the dead. But that was Jesus doing it. Now Jesus is gone. And technically that wasn't resurrection. That was just resuscitation. They would yet die sometime at the end of their lives. The, this is something unheard of, never experienced. In some ways, their, their rational minds just can't wrap around this kind of divine promise. And the same happens to us all the time. What do you mean, eternal family? My children have gone astray. That promise can't be fulfilled. And yet, will we remember? Oh yeah, he promised to work on the, the prodigal son and the, find the wandering sheep. Or how on earth will I ever be able to fulfill this calling? I'm not, I'm not adequate. And yet we'll remember that the Lord promised he would qualify those he calls. Oh, I have all these promises in my patriarchal blessing, but I've strayed and I've, I've lost opportunities. Again, it's just your mortal mind. It's your rational reason that cannot accept these things. But trust in a God who is above reason. Trust in a God who keeps his promises and then will remember. Oh, yeah. He said it would be this way. One other thing I absolutely love about what the angels said here is their question. It almost makes me wonder if angels have a sense of humor. Because there does seem to be some, some comic relief here. Here come these weeping women. Now they're wondering, women, and they're wondering about what's going on here. And where's the body? We came to re-anoint the Christ, to care for this body in its burial. But, and now it's gone? And the angels almost play stupid and try to keep a straight face and say to these sisters, what are you doing here? What, what are you looking for? Well, we're looking for the body of Jesus. And you picture them saying, 
why on earth would you look here? This is a cemetery. This is a sepulcher. And you picture the woman, the women really confused, like, well, where else are we going to find him? This is where his body was laid. Well, just a couple days ago. And now we're coming back to care for it. But in a sepulcher? In a cemetery? This is where you'd find the dead. And they're like, well, yeah. The... <laughs> and that's why I love the way the, the angels phrase this. Why seek ye the living among the dead? A cemetery seems to be a fitting place for dead bodies, but for a living, breathing being, there's, that's no place. This is no place for them. So what are you doing here? They just dropped the ultimate hint. But what I love about it is, I wonder if we ought to ask ourselves that question more often. Why am I seeking the living among the dead? Or another way to phrase it, why am I seeking life in dead places? There's an old saying, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, this is looking for life in all the wrong places. And we tend to do that all the time. My wife works in the world of addiction recovery, and that's a tragic example of looking for life in dead places looking for life, for hope, for me, just an escape from reality or from trauma or whatever they've gone through, and I'm looking for something better. I'm, I'm wanting life. But they end up succumbing to things that not only don't give them life, but end up taking what, whatever life they have remaining, taking it away from them. We may not be guilty of those kinds of addictions, but even in our distractions and diversions, we're looking for life, but is that a dead place too? It may not be life destroying, but it's certainly not life affirming. For that, you got to go to living places. And we know where those places are. Rewind the clock 21 years. And remember as a 12-year-old when Jesus is at the temple and Mary is freaking out, wondering where is he? finally finds him and is, we've been worried sick about you. Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And Jesus gently corrects his angel mother and says, how is it that you sought me? What do you mean you had to search, mother? Wouldn't you come straight to the temple? Where else would I be? This is where life is found. And, and I'm the life of the world. Think about that. All the Things Jesus has said about himself that affirm real life. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light and life of the world. And if you want to find life and find it in abundance, remember when he said that? In me you shall find life, and you shall find it abundantly. A life of such abundance that it bursts the bonds of death. That it, it blasts its way out of the tomb. That it, it fills to overflowing and spills out beyond the brim of a bitter cup. That's the kind of life that Jesus offers. But to find it, we'll have to come to living places. And so take stock of where we go. And will we ever find what we're looking for in places where real life is never to be found? Why seek we the living among the dead? Yes, why indeed. So Jesus isn't here. That's dawning on these sisters. He's risen. He's, he's gone. But what are we supposed to do now? They've seen angels, but they haven't seen him. And they had a plan for that, <laughs> that su Sunday morning. And there's no body to anoint. Where do we go from here? Well, I'm so glad you asked. And the angels have an answer for that. In the Mark account, chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, they're told, go your way, tell his disciples. There's the first thing you got to do. Go spread the good news. Share the gospel. That's what gospel means, good news. 
And this, you're going to want to trumpet from the housetops. Go tell the disciples. And in fact, one in particular, go tell Peter. Interesting that this chief apostle is already being singled out from among the other apostles. Go tell Peter. He'll know what to do from there. And this is what you need to tell him. Tell them that he, Jesus, goeth before you into Galilee. This is Jesus always leading the way. He'll be there. Go find him there. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. This is a, don't you know your marching orders already? What are you doing hanging around Jerusalem? You should be up in Galilee waiting for his arrival. He said this already. And they, the women, went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And afraid of what? Oh, afraid that this was too good to be true? Afraid that they were dreaming? I knew we should have waited till sun up. I was still in, the, still in the middle of my sleep. Or maybe afraid that the apostles wouldn't believe them. We'll see their reaction in just a moment. But isn't it an interesting combination of emotions that these women are feeling? In the Matthew version of this, it's all similar. The angels tell them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. So please, go end their mourning. Go dry their tears. Tell them that the good news so they don't have to sorrow any longer than absolutely necessary. Go run. And they will. He's, they say, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And since I'm an angel, you could probably take this on good authority. <laughs> yeah, I have told you. And so they, the women, departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Like I said, what a fitting combination of emotions. Fear and joy all mingled together. And little did they know how much joy would come to banish that fear entirely. Now, here's where it gets amazing as far as these sisters are concerned. Okay? Up to this point, they've only seen the angels. Well, only. I've seen angels would be amazing. <laughs> they've seen angels. They've been told, he is not here, he's risen. See what evidence I can offer you, namely an empty tomb. And then hightail it to the apostles, tell them about the coming of Christ to Galilee, and then everybody can head up north together to see him. And that's enough for these women. They go running to the apostles to tell them the good news. Now realize what they've seen and what they haven't seen. They haven't seen Christ. And yet they're basically going to go to the apostles and bear witness that Christ has risen, even though they don't have firsthand personal visual knowledge of this. Now, I want you to sit, sit here for a moment and wrestle with this, okay? Because we're about to see, we're going to see this repeatedly this week. And, and we need to really understand the principle that's being taught. I've talked already about the cross and the beautiful symbolism of a vertical post and a horizontal cross beam. We use that as an analogy for, or a symbol for the two great commandments. The first and foremost is to love God with all our heart, mind, mind and strength. That's what points us upward, raises our sights, lifts us to heaven. That's the vertical post. Plant it in gospel ground and keep it there permanently. And then on it, you have something to fix the horizontal crossbeam of the second great commandment. Loving thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? It's in that order, first and then second, vertical and horizontal. Well, in a, in a similar way, we can see the cross as a symbol of our testimony that has a vertical component as well as a horizontal component. Now, the vertical is the first-hand personal connection to God whereby we know the truth of these things. The horizontal is trusting the testimony of others that we're hearing from people side to side and they're bearing witness of the things that they know and will we trust them? Or will we reject that horizontal testimony because I only want a vertical one to stand on my own two feet, independent of anyone else? Now, which kind of testimony have these women received? So far, it's more along the lines of the horizontal one. They have not seen Christ for themselves, but they have heard from someone else. Now, again, the angel said, Lo, I'm telling you this. 
I, and I'm an angel, so it, take it on good authority. But still, it's, it's secondhand. I don't know it for myself. But that's enough for these sisters. Now, something we need to understand is as far as order of priority, vertical trumps horizontal. Priority-wise, we need to know for ourselves. It's like Joseph Smith when he came back from the sacred grove to his mother. I have learned for myself. Personal, individual witness from the Father and the Son. But in order of chronology, the order reverses. Ultimately, we want the vertical. But how do we get there? By trusting in the horizontal. We trust other people and accept their witness. And it, in some ways, it persuades us. It, it motivates us to go find a personal witness for ourselves. But at first, it is based in the witness of others. There's a reason God wants to move in that order. Because not only does he want us to connect with him vertically, he wants us to connect with one another horizontally. It's part of Zion. It's part of trusting one another. And having faith in each other, just like we have faith in God. And if I trust in one another on my way to gaining my own independent witness, then Zion is being created. As I look, as I love my neighbor and love my Lord. Is that making sense? These women... Keep the vertical and horizontal in mind as we see example after example of people believing or not believing these kinds of reports of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what amazes me here, with that in mind, go from Matthew 28 verse 8 to verse 9. And this is incredible. Verse 9, as they went to tell his disciples. So they're acting on faith. They're taking the angel's word for it. They're going to go bear testimony of things they don't yet have an absolute knowledge of. It's faith right now, but it's not a perfect knowledge. I believe what I've been told, but I haven't yet seen for myself. But I'm going to go and bear witness of this. And behold, as they went to tell, Jesus met them. Think about that. He came. I honestly wonder, was this unplanned? Because the, the original plan was, he's going to meet you in, in Galilee. That's what he's said all along. We're going to see quite a few visitations in Jerusalem in this week's lesson. Were they all premature in a way? Were they all almost the Savior jumping the gun like, I just, I can't wait. For my sake, more for theirs. For their sake, I just, I, I have to come. For these women, I have to reward their faith in the horizontal testimony of these angels by giving them a vertical witness of their own. And he comes. This is stepping into the darkness and having the light flood in. This is coming before the dawn and the dawn beating you to it. <laughs> this is worrying about the stone and find the stone rolled away. Do you, do you see this? I, I'm so moved by this because it really does seem like a surprise visit. Maybe even for Jesus. That ah, I, can't, I can't wait for Galilee. Uh, yes, I'll see you there too. But look, they believe. And now they will know. They'll know personally. And so they do. He comes. He meets them. He says, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet. Can you picture that? We don't. We lost you once. We're never going to lose you again. You can't leave us. Please stay with us. They held him by the feet. They worshipped him. And then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Over and over, this reassurance, no, nothing to fear anymore. I've conquered sin. I've conquered death. I'm, I'm here. Nothing to ever fear again. Just go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. I mean, that's where I was supposed to see you too, but ah, I just couldn't wait. Okay. Oh, this is so beautiful. 
his love for them, their love for him, holding him by the feet. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who publish peace. And here the Prince of Peace himself has come to publish the greatest message of peace imaginable. Death is conquered, man is free. Christ hath won the victory. Oh, I'd want to hold on to those feet too. Scarred as they are. But he lives again. For we have seen him. These women can bear... They started their journey thinking of bearing a certain type of testimony. They ended it being able to bear a completely different witness. It's so incredible. Now, with all of this, compare, hold on to this story, this very first initial one, because that's the standard uh, whereby we're going to judge all the others. Okay? This is the best example we're going to see and then compare it to all the others. And what we're going to see in, in these other instances is doubt and disbelief. Compared to this perfect faith leading to perfect knowledge on the part of these women, compare that to doubt and disbelief all around them. Let's start with the disbelief to get rid of that one and, and then get on to something that is probably closer to what we grapple with. I hope we don't have to deal with disbelief, which is worse than ignorance. It's opposition. Doubt, in some ways, is much more natural of just, I have a hard time believing until I know for myself. But disbelief is more of a pushing back. It's not just demanding evidence. It's almost trying to eliminate the evidence that already exists. It's misery that loves company. It's not enough to doubt. I want, to, I want others to doubt with me. I, let's spread disbelief. And that's the example we'll see as we continue the Matthew account. This is chapter 28, verse 11. Now, when they were going, the women are ready to go spread the news. Behold, some of the watch came into the city. Those watchmen that had been quaking in their boots when they, saw, when they felt the earthquake and saw the angels. Well, they quaked their way all the way back into town. And they showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. Did they describe the earthquake? Did they explain the visitation of angels? Can you imagine what would have happened for the chief priests as they hear this news? Just what we feared. The end is going to be worse than the beginning. Well, when they were assembled, these chief priests, with the elders, the same cabal of wicked leaders that had plotted Christ's crucifixion to begin with, now they're trying to do some damage control, these spin doctors getting together. How are we going to stop this thing? We killed Christ once. How do we kill the news of his resurrection? Well, once they had taken counsel, this is what they came up with. They gave large money unto the soldiers and said to them, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Got it? That, that's the line. You, you got to memorize it. Okay, let's rehearse it a few times. We had some negative experiences a couple days ago with false witnesses. Uh, we kept trying to convince them to say evil things about Jesus, but they kept messing it up and not getting their stories right. Uh, back in Caiaphas' palace. So forget that. Let's make sure we're on the same page here. What we're going to tell people is that the night watchman fell asleep, and sure enough, just like we worried, the disciples came rushing in under cover of darkness, stole away the body of Jesus, and disposed of it in some unknown location so they could trump up some kind of crazy story that Jesus had actually risen from the tomb. <laughs> like that's possible. Now, what's interesting about this story they're making up is it does seem plausible, right? In fact, compared to a, an account of the resurrection, this story actually mean, make, makes much more logical sense. And that's the irony. Yes, it's more rational, but it's not more real. It's a fabrication. It's a falsehood. They're lying. There's an irony here. They're accusing the apostles and disciples of one sin, namely theft, thou shalt not steal, when they're the ones guilty of the real sin, thou shalt not bear false witness. And they're lying. So there's wickedness on their part. There's hypocrisy on their part. And yet there's, there's a note of logic on their side. I hear anti-Mormons, especially ex-Mormons, constantly bring up Occam's razor. 
to say, I mean, Occam's razor suggests that the simplest explanation is always the right one. And I'll admit, in many instances, that's true. Is there just, is there a simple explanation that, that covers all the bases and, and, and has enough explanatory power to see us through? And the simpler, the better. Otherwise, are we trying to, all these other things, I don't know. They always accuse believers of what they call mental gymnastics. And, oh, yep, we've got Occam's razor on our side, and you have to rely on all these mental gymnastics to try to, to hold on to your belief. Well, are they taking a page from the elders and chief priests here? Are they taking counsel from them? Is there a simpler story we can tell? Even if it's false. Because the irony, to me, for example, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, they say, well, the Occam, Occam's razor, the simplest story, is that just jo Joseph Smith just made up the book. And then you don't have to exercise faith in things like angels and, and gold plates and a Urim and Thummim. And yet, if you really know Joseph Smith, <laughs> that's actually a simpler explanation than what you're coming up with with Joseph somehow cobbled together all these things from existing material in, in the Palmyra library. And, and he was enough of a genius to weave it all together. That's why people have grasped at straws for two centuries now with the Spalding theory and view of the Hebrews and the late great war and Napoleon's battle and all this pseudo biblicism that was in the, in the air at the time. And it's like, really? Man, you're taking logical leaps that in some ways, to me, are, are more ungrounded than my leaps of faith. It sounds like you have more faith in Joseph Smith than I do. I mean, you make him out to be some kind of gen literary genius. Me, I just believe he's a prophet of God. I do think Occam's razor comes down on the side of belief in that instance and in so many others. The other issue that I find a, a striking parallel is the fact that they had to pay the soldiers for, for saying this. And so the soldiers did have something to gain from their falsehood. And, and yeah, it would have to be large money for me to do that if I was a soldier. Notice they're called soldiers, not just watch. Because we might think of this as some kind of, I don't know, Jewish night watchman. And yeah, okay, well, I'm out of the job, but I'll just go back to carpentry or, or whatever, or, you know, agriculture. Now, here they're called soldiers, which suggests they're probably Roman. I mean, remember, Pilate had been washing his hands of this whole thing. And when the chief priests and elders rushed to him and said, we've got to set a watch, he's like, you do whatever you need to do, but I'm done. So did they hire some, some soldiers from the Antonia Fortress and set them not? I mean, if these are soldiers and they're going to tell the story that we fell asleep during a night watch, you can get court-martialed for stuff like that, right? I mean, next month when we get to the book of Acts, we'll see a strange story of a soldier who is on duty guarding prisoners. And there's a, a miracle where the prison walls fall down, and he assumes that all the prisoners have fled, and so expecting his own court-martial and execution for having prisoners escape on his watch, he figures, I'll save my superior officers, the the trouble of execution, and I'll execute myself. And he's ready to commit suicide. Now, that story has a happy ending. We'll see that next month. But that's serious business, to fall asleep on the watch? Oh, yeah, you, money? You're going to pay me? This is bribery? Well, it's, it better be large money, because I'm risking my life to tell this lie. Well, for those with testimony and faith, whether vertical or horizontal. Those who attack faith and come up with stories, some flat-out lies, others just half-truths, some truths but incomplete truths as they decontextualize history and paint the worst possible picture, or as they provide their laundry lists of complaints and concerns, and doubts and disbeliefs and hopes that it will spread and people won't dig a little deeper to find the rest of the story. I study anti-Mormonism and it's so interesting the tricks of the trade that are used. And I do worry 
Are they taking counsel with the chief elders, the chief priests and elders here? And are they making up stories? Are they banking on an Occam's razor in their favor that might not actually work? And are they in it, at least in part, and often large part, for the money? Because there is large money being made by ex-Mormon anti-Mormons. As I watch their videos and listen to their podcasts, it's amazing how often they plead for donations to their Patreon account. As they fill their, their content with advertisements, uh, beginning and end and interrupted throughout the middle, and every time they're making money, and making quite a bit of it. To see them accuse, to me it gets frustrating when they accuse believers of only believing if their, if their occupation depends on it, if their paycheck depends on it. They'll accuse people like me of, well, he's a BYU professor, or he's an institute teacher, and I mean, if they re really express their doubts, because none of them could possibly believe this stuff, they're too educated, they know too much. The only reason they stay in the church is because the church signs their paycheck. And they're unqualified to do anything else if they were to be fired. To which I want to go, really? Unqualified to do anything else? I could probably join you and make more money. You understand? I mean, there's ex-Mormon merchandise that they try to sell. And there is large money passing hands among those that are simply trying to tear down people's faith. And it's frustrating. <sighs> For these soldiers, probably still wondering and worrying, is the money enough? Notice the added level of reassurance. Oh, you got backup. There's a whole circle of people that will back you up. And this this... Oh, community of former Latter-day Saints that are on each other's shows and, and backing each other up. Notice verse 14 and 15. They continue to reassure the soldiers and say, If this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So decades passed. When Matthew is recording this in the gospel, he's looking around going, man, that gossip is still being spread. That's still the news, the word on the street. People saying, oh, <laughs> your Lord was resurrected, whatever. I heard that you guys stole away his body and the, the soldiers were just sleeping on the job. To which, again, I would say, do you think soldiers would admit to sleeping on the job? Well, that's why this reassurance was so necessary. Will, if the governor hears about it, I mean, if, if Pilate, believe me, we've had enough experience with Pilate not to be so worried about him. Uh, we were able to persuade him just a few days ago to do something against his own will. We can do it again. We secured Jesus' condemnation. I'm sure we can secure your exoneration. So don't worry about it. And they didn't. Now, if that's the disbelief side of things, we are trying to shove doubt down people's minds. We're trying to get them to disbelieve just like we do. This is more open opposition. Now let's shift from disbelief to mere doubt, where it's, man, this is hard to believe. Rising from the grave, that's never happened, at least not permanently. Uh, can I wrap my heart and head, especially the head, the heart would probably want to believe this, but the head, I, we saw him crucified. The spear, through the, the, the blood and water that came forth, there's no way anyone survived that. And to come back from it, how is that even possible? So shift to Luke chapter 24 and notice example after example of doubt among people that would never succumb to disbelief but had a hard time finding belief. Luke 24, verses 9 through 11. This is when the women returned from the sepulchre. It's right after the angel told them that Christ had risen. But they returned and they told all these things unto the eleven. 
and to all the rest. So this is both the apostles, the disciples that had gathered alongside them. And who were these women that were telling these stories? It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Now, at this point, you'd expect this incredible rejoicing collectively. Like, seriously? Really? The angels told you? Now, this is the Luke account. We don't have them seeing Jesus personally. That was in the Matthew account. But what? Is it a horizontal witness? Have they yet received the vertical? I don't know. But at least this horizontal testimony, isn't that something to rejoice over? You apostles and disciples assembled? Well, here's the tragedy. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Now, what's the problem here? Is it the fact that they're women? That's one thing these sisters all had in common. And can the word of a woman be trusted? Can women be brought before a court to bear witness of anything? even beyond the, the gendered challenges here, are we willing to trust the word of a mere mortal? What we're seeing here is the perceived insufficiency of a horizontal testimony. Nope. Uh, they, these are idle tales. This is probably wishful thinking on your part. You wanted it to be true so much that this is oh, confirmation bias, this is uh, willing yourself into some kind of testimony. We get accused of that all the time, too, by those who have left the church. You can't trust any of that. These are just idle tales, and they don't believe. This actually leaves me wondering how the women feel right now and how they would react to the apostles' reaction. What do you mean, idle tales? We've been following Jesus as long as you have. You don't trust me? Why, why would I make this up? It speaks volumes not only of their conviction to bear testimony, but also of their humility and their patience with fellow disciples who don't accept their testimonies. Oh, you returned missionaries know exactly how this feels. When we bear witness of things we know to be true, and people consider them idle tales or wishful thinking. Well, keep bearing testimony no matter what. I'm sure these women do. But what does Peter do? What do these other apostles do? Notice Luke 24, verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Can you picture Peter there, sprinting to the sepulcher, wondering? What? What to believe? I haven't seen angels. I haven't seen the risen Lord. But I can see the tomb and determine for myself if it's really empty. We haven't taken the body away. Did the chief priests and elders? Are they trying to desecrate that body? Is that why they set a watch to keep us at bay so they could do something behind the scenes? I, I want to find out for myself. But is part of this motivated by some level of doubt those words of the women, that's too good to be true. It's got to be an idle tale. There's no way. Now, in the Mark version of this, it's a different chronology, different set of series of events. But it ends with a note of doubt as well. This is Mark 16, 9 through 11. Now, when Jesus, and it kind of summarizes the whole story. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now, we haven't seen that specifically. We're going to have to wait for the John version in just a moment to see that. But he appears first to her, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, we, I wish we had more details about all of that, but we don't. So trying to be more specific as far as, ooh, what devils did she have? Is this some kind of little legion that she was dealing with? All of that would be pure speculation. So let's get past it and just realize how much she would have been grateful for Jesus and loved Jesus and wanted to follow Jesus. Well, after she sees the risen Lord, she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. I mean, she's dried her, her, her tears, but they're still weeping theirs. And so she wants to go and spread the good news. 
But then notice how this, this verse ends. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Ah, there they are, unable or unwilling to accept a merely horizontal testimony. Nope, I need a vertical witness of my own. No wonder they go running. Now, we're going to see more of that in the John account. But to get there, let's see how John fleshes out what Mark just gave us in a verse or two. And the John version in chapter 20 is slower, it's fuller, it has some different details than what we've seen in the synoptics. We should be used to that by now from the book of John. But turn to John 20 and just savor every sentence because he's going to walk us through this resurrection miracle unlike any of his, his other evangelists. John 20, verse 1, it's the first day of the week. And cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now, the, no talk of angels here. She hasn't seen anything except an open tomb. It's still dark out. Is she coming alone before the other women come? That's a possibility as we try to, to merge these accounts. But notice what she does. She doesn't know anything that's going on except the fact that the stone is gone. So, she runs. She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, chief apostle standing out, right? And to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's how John always referred to himself in the gospel. So she rushes to her priesthood leaders, Simon Peter, John the beloved, and saith unto them all that she knows. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. She doesn't know that he's risen. She has no evidence of that. They ju she just knows the body is gone and is devastated by that fact. To me, there's a beautiful lesson here, by the way, that if we feel like we have lost Jesus, whether it's of our own doing or simply circumstances in life, but we feel far away from God, and we don't know where to look. Maybe we are starting to explore in dead places and have been deadened by them ourselves. Maybe we don't know or at least are unsuccessful in searching for the living, even in living places. Well, where should we go? I love what Mary does. She runs to the apostles. She seeks out special witnesses to, to try to find out from them, where should I go? How can I find Jesus again? That is a gift that prophets and apostles have, being able to show us the way. Well, to this point, not even Peter and John know what to do. This is all news to them, right? Remember, the women are the initial witnesses, not the men in this story. It's beautiful. And so what happens next? John chapter 20, verse 3. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Now, is there some competition between Peter and John? Oh, maybe. Who gets to sit on your right hand? Who's the chief apostle? Who's the rock and who's the son of thunder? Well, these two friends are hightailing it to get to the sepulchre as quickly as they can. In most depictions of this, by the way, I love the paintings of this moment. Uh, one of my favorites shows Peter and John with looks on their faces that speak volumes, and they're running as fast as they can to get to the sepulchre. By the way, hold that in one hand. I wish there were more paintings of the women in in full sprint. Remember that it's the, these, these men are running toward the tomb, one with question marks. The women are running away from the tomb with exclamation points. They're running to the apostles to tell them the good news of what they've told, what they've heard, what they've seen, what they've experienced, only to be met with doubt once they arrive. Idle tales. I mean, even that, that phrase, you ever heard the, the word, it's an old wives' tale? Mm, there's gendered doubt. 
Oh, I guess there's some woman probably over emotional and oh, careful, careful about those accusations. This is not an old wives' tale. These are not idle tales. This is personal witness. But well, we better run and find out for ourselves. You understand what I'm doing with, with these two? I, I, again, put them side by side, and I'll take the, the, the running women any day. Okay. Well, here we have these two running men. And usually in those depictions, John is painted as a younger man than Peter. And so, yeah, fresher legs, and he out distances Peter and gets to the tomb first. But he stays outside. And I think there's some humility there. There's some caution there. Is this holy ground? Should I take my shoes off? Should I enter? I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. And I'll wait for my senior apostle to figure this out. And Peter eventually gets there. I will say, too, there's a good lesson here for all of us not to try to outrun apostles, not to try to outpace prophets. There's an interesting story from church history when Lorenzo Snow, through his own scripture study and significant pondering. Lorenzo Snow was better educated than most others of, uh, of the church leaders of his day and knew his scriptures and tried to make sense of things and put two and two together and realized divine potential is a scriptural concept. And God really does want us to become like him and wants to make us more like him. Oh, divinization, apotheosis, all those technical terms. Humanity's divine potential is real. And Lorenzo Snow knew it. When he was on his mission in England, he asked his quorum president, Brigham Young, about it. And Brigham said, whoa, I, I think you're right. These scriptures back it up, and I, I do believe that's true. However, if it's true and meant for everyone to know, then Joseph Smith will let us know. The Lord will let Joseph Smith know. So let's hold off until we learn it from him. And Lorenzo Snow thought that was wise. Some good restraint there. I, he may have sprinted to the sepulcher first, but Lorenzo Snow crouched at its entrance and waited for Joseph to enter. And sure enough, once Joseph revealed those things in the, publicly at the King Follett Discourse, Lorenzo Snow got the green light he'd been praying for, and he taught it every chance he could. There's, I see sometimes people who are struggling in their faith because they feel like apostles and prophets are too slow. They're taking too long. And I don't like this policy, or I'm not sure about this procedure, or I just want to do my own thing, and, oh, be careful. Be careful. I think there's a tendency among some to try to outpace prophets. And again, since the prophet is in charge, has a stewardship for the whole church and the whole world, it's not just a matter of what is true, but when is the right time to teach that truth. I, I, does that make sense? I, I do love the thought of John and his restraint, despite his, his foot speed. Now, eventually Peter does arrive, right? Verse 6, then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher. So nothing holding him back. This is bold, impetuous Peter. Comes right on in. And he seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now those are very specific details. You picture John here just struck by the moment, and everything just frozen in time, engraven in his soul. Oh, this mental image that he'll remember for the rest of his life. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher. So John now comes in, seeing that Peter went in first. And he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So believed, yes. Fully understood, no. Believed what? Believed that Christ had risen? Maybe. Maybe that's starting to dawn on him, although the scripture doesn't completely make sense yet. And all that Jesus had said already so clearly, but no, nah, not as far as they were concerned. Is he believing 
something smaller, like the horizontal witness of these women? Is he believing the tomb really is empty for good reason, not for bad? Something's happening in John. Something's happening in Peter. By the way, when it comes to that laying aside of the burial clothes, and the clothing, clothing here and the napkin there, how I've heard some amazing stories about that, that supposedly are grounded in Jewish tradition, but may actually not be. Uh, Jesus coming back because the napkin and, oh, be careful. But hold on to this reality of Jesus laying that, that clothing aside, just like he had done in pre-mortality, laying aside his garments of glory, just like he had done with his own mortal flesh, laying that aside as he commended his spirit into the hands of the Father. Laying this clothing aside to be wrapped in robes of righteousness and robes of resurrection instead. But even the thought of folding it and placing it, there does seem to be something intentional there, something contemplative there. Can you picture, I don't know if it was angels that, that were cleaning things up afterwards, or as I would prefer to think, Jesus himself, spirit re-entering the body, sitting up, looking around the sepulcher, taking the burial clothes. Remember when he brought Lazarus forth from the grave and asked the people there, unbind him. <laughs> He's free. <laughs> and to take those, uh, that clothing, that linen cloth, and to fold it and to lay it there where he had been laid. Remember, this is that, that, that linen belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. He had bought it, purchased it new for the occasion. And since Jesus was now leaving the tomb for Joseph's later use, perhaps that cloth for Joseph's later use as well. Either way, I do love the thought of Jesus just thinking, alone in the tomb, ready to burst forth triumphant, I remember when I bought my first set of temple robes. Instead of just renting them as I had as I had done as a missionary, and then putting them in the, into the various bins to be washed and prepared for some other patron, to instead fold those robes of the holy priesthood, to do it intentionally and contemplatively mindfully, it added an entirely new element to my temple worship of just caring for those garments of glory. I wonder if Jesus is doing something similar. But then verse 10, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. To do what there? To ponder? To process? To plan? I mean, they still haven't seen anything. They've just seen an empty tomb. Meanwhile, Mary, what is she doing? Is she wondering if they believe her, wondering what to do next? She stays behind. She stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth so much more than what she'd seen before. It wasn't absence, it was now presence. She seeth two angels in white sitting the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And now she finally sees something. I wonder if part of this was a reward for her willingness to linger there, to just stay, to abide by the sepulcher. Not to just go back home like Peter and John had just done, but to, well, to borrow the language of Exodus, to turn aside to see. Remember that with the burning bush? To stop what she was doing and give this moment her full undivided attention. 
to which the angels come rushing in to show her things she had not seen before. Verse 13 and 14, they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Which again sounds like a dumb question. And yet talk about an introspective one. What really is the reason behind your tears? Do you not yet know that there's no reason to cry? A great scene in church history where Jane Elizabeth Manning, that wonderful African-American convert that had trudged hundreds and hundreds of miles from Connecticut to Nauvoo through the snow, and came to Nauvoo and Joseph and Emma found families for all of her family members to move into and live with as they got their own feet underneath them. And then Jane, one morning weeping, and Joseph coming to her and saying, Oh, Jane, don't you know that here we dry every tear from every eye? Well, there's no sorrow in Nauvoo. We take care of each other. And so began taking care of Jane in beautiful ways. Well, here's these angels. Woman, why weepest thou? We're here to wipe away every tear from every eye as well. But she answers. She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. It's basically the same thing she had said to the Peter and John before. But back then she had said, they've taken away the Lord. And I don't know where to find him. Here it's my Lord. And I love that possessive pronoun. She feels such a connection to Christ. He is hers. And she is his. And I don't know where he is. She says, I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. I mean, she is flooded by emotion. She doesn't, there's so much she doesn't know yet. She's seeing angels, ends up seeing the Lord, but doesn't know who she's seeing. She knows the tomb is empty, but doesn't know where the body is. And her Occam's razor is that somebody must have taken him. But the Lord... God doesn't, a God of miracles doesn't have to settle for the, the simplest explanation of things. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. But here's Mary so overwhelmed by emotion that she's unable to recognize Jesus when he's standing right in front of her. This seems to be another one of those, oh, premature visits. Oh, I can't wait for, for Galilee. I've got to come right here in Jerusalem. I'm not going to ha wait for her to come to me. I'll come to her. She needs that. And she deserves it. So Jesus comes. But I do wonder sometimes if our emotions get the better of us. And if it's our fear. Or if, if it's impatience. Or if it's just oh, some emotional overload that makes it hard for us to hear the still small voice. Or difficult for us to recognize Jesus in the situation we find ourselves in. She doesn't see him for who he is either. But then, verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, which again is like milady, a term of respect. Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Another beautiful chance for her to express herself. Jesus not rushing in to solve the issues, but rather to ask, to be an active listener. Why are you weeping and what do you seek? Now, supposing him to be the gardener, and he was, the gardener of Eden, the gardener of Gethsemane, but she doesn't recognize any of that. She just thinks that he's the caretaker. He's probably here. He had to rest the Sabbath before, and so he's here to pull up some weeds Oh, he's here for so much more than that. But she saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Which is so beautiful on her part. I mean, really? Logistically? Again, how are you going to do that? You're going to carry the body all by yourself? What, what are you going to do? She doesn't know. She just wants to do something. And she's distraught because she can do nothing. So, sir... Please tell me what I can't know for myself. And she gets more than she could have possibly imagined. 
Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Just one word, her name. Didn't even have to say it twice like he so often did. <laughs> Martha, Martha, or Simon, Simon. No, just a single Mary. But that's all it took. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. This is such an incredible, intimate moment. I, I hope we're not intruding. To see Jesus letting her speak, diagnosing before he prescribes, what are you going through? And what are you seeking now? What are your struggles? What are your hopes? We need to do so much more of that when we see people struggling. Instead of rushing in with our solutions, just sit with them. Let them weep. Let them, let them not recognize that help is right in front of them. No, don't force them to come to your place. Go with them to, to theirs and ask. Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And best of all, once you know what they need, introduce them to Jesus. Help them see him. And what's one of the best ways to see him? Let him call them by name. Because that's all it took here. To me, there's something profound about that moment of recognition. I know him because he knows me. Have you ever had moments in your life where you could honestly put a finger down on the date at the moment in your life when you knew the Lord knew you? For me, my patriarchal blessing is one of those moments. My mission call was another one of those moments. And my marriage was another one of those moments. Those are the three greatest I can think of when I knew that specific moment, not just a generalized awareness of God toward his children, but rather that God knew me individually and had a plan for me and a place for me and a person for me. And I'm so grateful for those realizations of personal recognition. Do you realize that whenever a priesthood holder places his hands upon your head, he is acting in the place of Jesus. That's what his authority is. What he is doing, what he's pronouncing is in the name of Jesus Christ. So for all intents and purposes, it's Christ's hands, not his. And how does he begin the blessing? With your name, Mary. Do you, do you realize, do you recognize, do you see him for who he is? I pray that we can, because that changes everything. It did for her. In verse 17, this moment of absolute euphoria on her part. Remember when Jesus came prematurely to the women and they just clasped his feet, not wanting him to leave? Mary is going to do the same thing. In the order, I've wondered, has, has, have the women been there already? And the, was Mary first, saw it, then rushed, got Peter and John, they rush, and then they take off to go back home. She stays. Have, have the women already been there too? And then they leave. Did Jesus come to Mary first and then go and visit those other women on the way as they go to approach the other apostles? Again, it's hard to harmonize everything in these, in these accounts. But to see in this moment, that's just the two of them. Mary and Jesus outside the tomb as ashes are turned into beauty, as sorrow is swallowed up in joy. So verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. And a better description of that is, hold me not. Don't, don't, don't keep me here. Why? For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. And that's a phrase that he's used several times in different accounts. My brethren, 
family of faith here, not just my servants, not just my apostles, my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. How's that for possessive pronouns? Jesus lifting us up to his level, sons and daughters of the same Heavenly Father, servants of the same living God. Go tell them that. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. What glorious news. Far more than horizontal testimony, this is vertical witness. She knows for herself. She's experienced this. The best she can give to them is a horizontal account. But in hopes that they will come running and gain a vertical witness themselves. Just like she has. By the way... When Jesus says, don't hold me here, I haven't yet ascended to my Father, that's shocking news. Wait, 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 you haven't seen the Father yet? What have you been doing? I mean, Friday afternoon, it was, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I thought you would immediately go straight back to him. Well, I, there was a lot of work I needed to do. I needed to, rather than me return to the Father, I had to point the way for everyone else to be able to do the same. And since no man cometh unto the Father but by me, I needed to organize the spirits of the righteous to go preach. I needed to turn paradise loose on prison so that they could come unto the Father by me. And then, I, w I really didn't mean to go to him as soon as that was done. I mean, you'd think that Returning and reporting on this mission would be the most important thing in eternity. The son returning to the father, reporting that his earthly mission was done. But no, the redemption of the dead, that, I should probably do that first. And then they could, that can be going on in my absence as I go to the father. So now I'll go to the father. Ooh, but wait, mm, Mary. A weeping woman outside a tomb. Can you picture Jesus caught between the need to return and report and the desire? His bowels filled with compassion. Remember 3 Nephi 17? I gotta go. You're my other sheep, but I have other other sheep, and I've got to go preach to the lost tribes of Israel. And they just, mm, they can't even bring themselves to ask because uh, putting the lost tribes on hold just for our sake when we've already had a full day with you and it's been incredible, we can't bring ourselves to ask for anything more. But they looked upon him as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer and recognizing that desire in their part, what does Jesus do? He can't help himself. His bowels are filled with compassion and so he stays and blesses them in ways that go far beyond anything else you see in 3 Nephi. It's amazing. And it's a bonus chapter. Unplanned. Because he loves people. I see a similar thing happening here with Mary Magdalene. Oh, the lost tribes have been lost for a long time. They can wait a few more days. Sorry. The father... If I only do those things that my father does, this is what my father would do too. He'd put our reunion on hold so I can comfort someone. A single, solitary, sorrowing sister. There's bowels of mercy. There's compassion. There's Christ. In verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, so it's still Sunday, it's still Easter Sunday, but it's now getting close to nightfall. And the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And you can't blame them for that. Their leader had just been executed. Would they be next? Well, despite the fact they're behind closed doors, having heard Mary's testimony, they've received the horizontal and now what are they going to do about it? Are they going to disbelieve? Is this just an idle tale? Are they curious but also confused? What are they going to do? Here they are assembled, and behind those closed doors came Jesus. 
and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. He always said that. He said that back in the Last Supper when they realized that peace was going to be taken from them. But here he is back and reassuring them. Peace. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. If that's not the greatest understatement in all of Scripture, I don't know what is. Oh, we were glad. <laughs> you think? Their fear has been replaced by joy. Peace be unto you. Yeah, you better believe it. There's nothing to lose peace over. Because death itself has been conquered. Nothing Nothing to fear ever again. Jesus is with them. And then verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Does he have to continue to give them this reassurance? Is there still this perplexity on their part? Well, Jesus goes on with this reassurance. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Remember, apostle means one who is sent the Father sent the Son, and the Son sends the apostles, and he doesn't send them away empty-handed. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Here's more of that sealing power, bind on earth and bound in heaven, loose on earth, loosed in heaven. These are judges in Israel, after all. They're going to be sitting on thrones someday judging the tribes of Israel. They better get used to it and start practicing now. So go do this. But what gift has he given them? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I said at the Last Supper that I would leave, but a comforter would come. In fact, that I had to leave to make way for the comforter. Second member of the Godhead clearing the way to make room for the third to come but breathed on them? I thought it was the laying out of hands. Well, that's how we do it. Jesus can do it any way he wants. But breathing seems beautifully appropriate because breath in Hebrew is the same word as wind and the same word as spirit. Think back to Genesis when the spirit of the Lord moved upon the, the waters of the great deep. The, the breath of God breathing, speaking, and bringing forth order out of chaos. This is a new creation. And it's a creation through the Comforter. New made men because of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now we're going to see that more dramatically next week in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost. But here's the promise. Remember, it's a, it's a command. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I'm breathing it out. Will you breathe it in? Will you accept it? Will you receive it? Now, verse 24 and 25, famous part of the story. But Thomas, ah, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, the other disciples therefore said unto him, when he finally did show up, We have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Wow. Now again, I don't want to reduce Thomas to this moment alone. Remember, we, we call him Doubting Thomas, but remember we called him Daring Thomas? When Jesus made it clear, I'm going to Jerusalem. And it was Thomas, not even bold Peter, but Thomas, who said, if you're going, then we'll go with you. And if you're going to die, then we'll die right alongside. Thomas was a good soul. But, as we've been talking today, he refused to settle for a horizontal testimony. He would only be convinced by a vertical witness of his own. I have to, and it has to be tangible. I mean, this is pretty intimate, what he's describing here. I want to touch, I want to thrust my hand into his side. It's like, wow, really? If you were standing in front of Jesus, I don't know if I'd demand, make those kinds of demands on him. I would, I would believe, I hope. But here he is making these demands, and I wonder, did it all start by just, I, honestly, I wonder where he was. When it says he was not with them when Jesus came, man, you missed out on a meeting. 
<laughs> you ever been to a meeting or a fireside and afterwards you ask somebody who was there, so did I miss anything? I always laugh when my students ask me that when they've been, you know, they were sick or they were absent. It's like, hey, did I miss anything last time? Sometimes I'm tempted to respond a little kind of snarky and go, oh, no, we totally just wasted the hour. I mean, you know me in class. I mean, we, we just kind of chew the fat and don't really get into anything significant. So, yeah, you didn't miss a thing. I'm shocked that anybody comes to class at all. It's like, of course you missed something. That's why I hope you can come. But imagine Thomas. Hey, Peter, James, John. Sorry I couldn't make it to the meeting. Did I miss anything? Oh, you have no idea what you missed. When my wife sang with the Mormon Youth Chorus years ago, I went with her every week. We were dating, and it was my chance to have time with her. I'd drive up for an hour and then sit there and listen to her and the others sing and while I did homework, and then drive back with her. Of course, I had perfect attendance. I knew the songs better than the, the, half the choir. But I did miss one day shortly before finals in December. I just had too much to do. And she called me on the way home and said, Jared, you're going to hate yourself for missing. President Hinckley came today to our little choir practice and in fact conducted our choir in the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, seriously? The one day I miss, I miss the prophet? And here's poor Thomas. The one day I miss... Now, again, he may have had all the right reasons in the world. I'm not trying to judge him or condemn him here for that, for just being gone. But man, he missed out. Think of Simeon. Think of Anna that were where they needed to be when the baby Jesus was brought to the temple. Glad they were there that day. Glad I'm where I need to be when the Savior can come. But notice also the way he puts this. Until I see, touch, feel. What senses is he requiring? Epistemology is the technical term for how we know what we know. And his was going to be a sensory epistemology. I need to see, I need to touch, and until I do and have that tangible kind of evidence, I will not believe. That's pretty adamant. Refusing to believe until I, am, I have it proven to me in my own way. Is this sign-seeking? I, 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 I hesitate. Okay? He's not a Korahor. He's not a, a Sherem. But there is this demand for something I can wrap my rational mind around. Something I can feel and measure and weigh and touch. And again, it's this unwillingness to settle for a horizontal testimony on the way to a vertical one. I... It's interesting to actually admit, are you, what are you saying, you don't trust us? To which I would say, don't complain, you didn't trust the women. You see what blows me away about this? When we call him Doubting Thomas, there's a part of me that wants to go, whoa, 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 time out. Because if you're going to call him Doubting Thomas for demanding a first-hand witness and not settling for a second-hand horizontal testimony along the way, then you're going to have to refer to Peter as Doubting Peter, and James as Doubting James, and Doubting John, and Doubting everyone except for those celestial sisters. The women that trusted the angel's testimony before they had had a personal witness of their own. You sisters should stand tall when you study the resurrection. Because you put us men to shame. I'm not trying to pit the genders against each other. I'm not trying to minimize men here. But I'm recognizing what I see on the page. That it was these sisters that had the humility to accept. In some ways, sisters, and again, I don't want to overgeneralize, but there are some interesting... The horizontal nature of... Sisterhood of being aware of those around them, wanting to do right, not just be right, making decisions based on how it will affect others, not just how, if this is the right or wrong thing to do. It's, it's amazing to me, the, the sisterhood, the, 
the companionship, the willingness to trust one another, the horizontal component that sisters embody so beautifully that we men in our insistent verticality could learn something from. So, Thomas, we're all doubters until we make ourselves willing to believe. And it's believing others on the way to believing for ourselves. Faith on the way to perfect knowledge. Out on the way to up. Make sense? I'll even point out the detail here that his name was Thomas called Didymus. It's interesting because Didymus means twin. Thomas was a twin. Now, twin brother of whom? There's been all kinds of speculation on that, as you'd expect. Some have even speculated he was Jesus' twin brother. And that requires some explanation. Like, huh? Virgin birth? How does that work? Well, that, that takes us beyond what I'll, 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 I'll avoid that explanation here. But there's some that, that go down that road. Others that suggest other people, but whatever, wh whoever it is, Thomas had a twin. For me, I'll stick with the symbolic here and suggest that symbolically speaking, Thomas's twin was himself, but on a lesser level. Do we sometimes joke about, oh, that's my evil twin? Well, in this case, this is Thomas's doubtful twin. And we all have one. Within every human heart is this line dividing faith from doubt. And, uh, and we're torn. This is, Lord, I believe, uh, help thou mine unbelief from that distraught father. And here's Thomas with a choice to make. Will I be believing Thomas or doubting Thomas? The choice is his. And the choice is ours. We're all Didymus. We're all twins. And will we be the natural man's side or the spiritual man's side as we approach the things of God? Will that happen that Sabbath? Excuse me, Christian Sabbath, not Jewish. That Sunday, Easter Sunday. The apostles were gathered. Uh, they were, ten of them were there. Judas gone. Uh, Thomas absent for whatever reason. Comes back, what I miss? Oh, you missed everything. Well, I, I've missed nothing until I know what I've missed for myself. Okay, fine. But we can't offer you the evidence that you require. That's, that's actually really important for us to understand, especially when we're, when we're talking with doubters or people that just have a hard time accepting until they know for themselves. You cannot give them what they demand. I cannot produce for you the kind of evidence that you require. I can simply bear a horizontal testimony. And with some compassion and some empathy, admitting that, yeah, it wasn't enough for me either. But it started something, and I had some disbelief or some doubt, but I did eventually come to know for myself. You can too, if you'll just keep asking, keep seeking, keep, continue faithful. And Thomas does. He comes back a week later, and this is verse 26. And after eight days, does that include the first day and the eighth? Is this the next Lord's Day? Is this the new Christian Sabbath taking shape? Is this Sunday? Perhaps. But after eight days, again, his disciples were within. And Thomas with them. He learned to stick around. Okay. By the way, the fact eight days passed, and it wasn't just, oh, I missed it yesterday. Jesus, can you come today? It, that's, that's beyond us. We don't make those kinds of demands. If we miss the moment, it might be a while before a second chance appears. It's not going to come on our schedule. It comes on the Lord's. But here the Lord's day has arrived. The disciples are together again. Thomas is with them. And then came Jesus. The doors being shut. He stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you, just like he'd said the week before. And then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Everything you demanded, I'll even meet you there. Are you still as insistent as you were last week? And then he says, and this is an invitation that we all need to take seriously, 
Be not faithless, but believing. Did you catch that? He didn't just he didn't say, shame on you for having questions. Or even shame on you for having doubts. No, he didn't. If any of you lack wisdom, I'm not going to upbraid you for that. But it wasn't doubt or question as a, a propositional thing. It was doubting and questioning as an attitudinal thing that Jesus was concerned about. I've done a lot of pondering about faith and doubt in Scripture. And I'm amazed that it's always used as a verb, not a noun. Doubt, that is. We, some, we use it more as a noun. I have my doubts, as if to say, I have some questions. And that's fine. Have, have your questions. That's not, to be, that's not to be condemned. We're imperfect. We don't know everything. What is of greater concern is when that proposition, that noun, becomes an attitude, becomes a verb. It becomes my default. It's how I approach the world. I approach it doubtfully instead of faithfully. It's an adverb now. <laughs> you, get, so you see that part of speech? The way Jesus describes it here, don't be faithless. Don't let that be your default. Don't be skeptical or cynical. Be believing. Again, a state of being, the way you approach things. I would far rather be a trusting individual and occasionally get burned, in which case I feel sad for the person that tricked me, deceived me, rather than the opposite, where by nature I'm cynical, I don't trust anyone, and sometimes I'm proven right, but I'm still left with this just negative view of the world. No, I'd far rather be trusting. I'd rather be believing. That doesn't make me gullible. I try to be careful too. But I do approach relationships, especially relationships with God, with an open mind and an open heart and a desire to believe. Be believing. Well, verse 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And that's it. That's what he says. That's the sum total of his response to Jesus. He, there's, I think there's so much in there. I think there's repentance there. I think there's confession there. I think there's contrition there. I'm so sorry I made demands. I'm in no position to make demands of anything. I get that sense sometimes from people that are making demands. I feel entitled to proof. Oh, you're far away from Jesus, aren't you? Remember what Elder Renlund once taught, that the farther away we are from the source of assistance, the more entitled to it we feel. And I wonder if just last week, Thomas was feeling entitled. Jesus is gone. He's devastated. He misses the Lord, but probably feels like he'll never see him again. And everyone else has this powerful experience, and why, why didn't I get one? Nope, I, mean, I don't believe you horizontally until I get my own vertical experience one-on-one. -on -one. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to see, I'm going to have to touch, I'm going to thrust my hand. And when Jesus comes and offers him exactly what he asked, what he demanded, Thomas is no longer making any demands at all. I don't even know if he went through with it and touched and thrust. He probably did, probably because Jesus insisted on it. He did do the same in 3 Nephi 11, right? I want you to come and touch me. I want you to know for yourselves so that you can bear a witness unlike any other. Enough that it will spark, that your horizontal testimony will spark in others a desire to emulate your search for truth and come to know for themselves in an independent, vertical way. Thomas, come. Come and see. And he, now that he's close to the Lord, is making no demands at all. Nothing but humility. Nothing but acceptance. I'm not entitled to anything. Least of all, an explanation from you for the situation I've, I'm in. And where were you before? Or why weren't you this? Or why wasn't I that? And 
No, it's, it's nothing but testimony and a possessive one at that. My Lord, my God. And then it's Jesus that continues the conversation. He saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. That's good. But there is something better. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Some epistemologies are more praiseworthy than others. And a willingness to hold to a horizontal testimony as you search and prepare for a vertical one, that's even better. In some ways, faith is even superior to perfect knowledge. Because faith endures a risk. Faith overcomes doubt. It wrestles with it. Perfect knowledge doesn't have any doubt to wrestle with. It's obvious. It's crystal clear. Perfect knowledge, as we learn from Alma and we learn from the brother of Jared, eclipses both faith and doubt. There's not room for either one of them. There's no line down the human heart anymore in this internal wrestle. It's no longer, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. It's just, I know. And even the devils know and tremble. Now, faith in some ways far surpasses knowledge. And trust in another as we work towards full faith in God and knowledge of Him. That's something superior too. It's beautiful the way he puts this. He actually says a similar thing in 3 Nephi as he begins his sermon at the temple. After 3 Nephi 11 is done and Jesus has allowed everyone to come to know for themselves, intimate moment, one-on-one, -on -one, one by one, come and see and feel and know and then go out and bear testimony. This is what Jesus says to start his sermon. 3 Nephi 12 verse 1 and 2. Blessed are ye if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you to minister unto you. Now, you should trust them. You've seen me ordain them. You've seen me choose them. And you know me. You know them. So blessed are you if you'll follow. But then, let's take it up a notch. And again, more blessed are they who shall believe in your words because that ye shall testify that ye have seen me and that ye know that I am. Yea, blessed are they who shall believe in your words and come down into the depths of humility and be baptized, for they shall be visited with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Yes, they'll get their own visit. They'll have that fire. They'll have that Holy Ghost. But not at first. At first, they're going to have to trust in you. Then that requires humility, the depths of it. You understand what he's saying? It's like, how many steps removed are you from the absolute knowledge of truth. And the further removed you are, the, further, the, the, the links in the chain, you're actually more blessed for believing from that distance. Now, he doesn't mean for you to stay there, right? Be baptized and get your own, get, get further, get the fire, get the Holy Ghost, come to know for yourself. He's, I'm not saying that he wants us to stay on the horizontal level, but he wants that to be sufficient to start. And if we're making demands for, I, I, I'm not going to trust anyone until I know for myself, then yeah, you end up with an independent witness, but you remain independent. And in the gospel, in the kingdom of God, we're supposed to be interdependent with one another, right? Horizontal and vertical, all fused together. That's what the cross entails. Making sense? There is something powerful about this pathway paved with humility and trust and faith on our way to perfect knowledge. And Jesus has taught it to Thomas beautifully. But like I said, it wasn't just to Thomas. It was to everyone minus the women who nailed it from the start. In fact, speaking of doubt as the default for so many, the, the twins, right? We're back to being a Didymus. And will I honor my believing side or my skeptical side? Will I lean in the direction of faith or lean in the direction of doubt? You see it on, on you saw it in Thomas, you see it in everybody. 
And in Matthew 28, here's another example. I'll give you one from Matthew and then I'll give you one from Mark. Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, just like you'd expect. But then three words you don't expect. But some doubted. What? They saw him. They worshipped him. How could anybody doubt now? Well, that's the thing. If doubt has become your attitude, your approach, your default, it's really hard to overcome. Even when perfect knowledge has come to eclipse it, that was core horse problem. So, okay, fine, fine. I admit it. I know it now. Uh, I confess that. Uh, can I have my voice back? Can you reverse this sign that I was demanding? And Alma's like, no, because it hasn't changed your heart. Your default is still wrong. And I wonder about some of these disciples that are still doubting. By the way, I looked up the Greek word for that, doubt. Some doubted. And the word, the root word is distatso. And dis means to, and stasis or stasis means your stance or your standing. And it's a really a powerful word because distatso suggests some kind of two standing or two stances, like you're vacillating between two different positions. How long halt ye between two opinions, right? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Which side of the aisle are you on? Are you a, are you, do you believe or do you doubt? As a verb, as an attitude, as your approach to life. And those doubters, it's so interesting that there they are waffling and wavering with two different stances. I see them, but I don't know. And uh, will I? It makes sense. Now that's the Matthew version. How about this Mark one? Mark 16, 12 to 14. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them, and that's the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, which we'll see in just a moment when we turn to Luke 24. As they walked and went into the country, that's when the Savior appeared to them. And once they knew for themselves, they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. <sighs> so it's not just that they're disbelieving women with their idle tales. It's these other two disciples. Nope, I don't know. I can't take you guys seriously either. They don't believe the disciples on the road to Emmaus. That's tragic. Keep going. Afterwards, he, Jesus, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. <laughs> I love that. Back to James 1.5. God will never upbraid us if it's lack of wisdom that we suffer from. But lack of faith, that mm, he can upbraid you for. That's one, oh, do, don't be not faithless, but believe in. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Allow for the possibility of, di of divine truth being confirmed to you. Receive the Holy Ghost. And let that fire of faith burn out doubt from within you. It's so interesting how this all comes together. It is a real wrestle. One of the things that I think goes underappreciated in the resurrection accounts is the wrestle between faith and doubt on the part of Christ's own followers. And the vertical and the horizontal and the epistemology and how we know and the demands that we make and the entitlements that we feel, it really is fascinating. And as far as the timing of all of this, as we see when we turn to Luke 24 in a moment, that happened on Easter Sunday. Jesus was busy on Easter Sunday with all kinds of preliminary visitations. It's, not, it, it's for all kinds of people. He can't wait till Galilee. And he sees... He comes to Mary Magdalene. He comes to the women. He comes to uh, the apostles in that upper room. He comes to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Oh, it's so fascinating to see how it, all, how it all plays out. But doubt seems to lurk in the shadows, even in places where Jesus has appeared. Hmm, what kind of proof are we seeking? It's actually really fascinating. 
because of the way the book of Mark ends. What I just read to you about, they didn't believe the disciples on the road to Emmaus, is near the end of Mark. And we'll, we'll conclude Mark in just a moment. But what's interesting about the ending of Mark, Mark chapter 16, is we're not sure if that's really how the book ended. And this isn't just skepticism speaking. This is good scholarship. Because Mark has a certain oh, language and tone and approach that's pretty consistent throughout his book. Until you get to chapter 16 and verse 9 marks a shift. From verse 9 through verse 20, that last 11 or 12 verses of the book of Mark seem really foreign. Uh, it's hard to tell in English, but in the Greek, he uses Greek words that he's never used anywhere else in his 16 chapters. It's almost like, all, what, all of a sudden you learn new vocabulary for your last dozen verses? That's odd. Uh, and so the belief here is that Mark actually ended, the Gospel of Mark, which was most likely the first one written, ended really abruptly in Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And 9 through 20 was added on later by people who knew Matthew and Luke and John. Because there's a lot of similarities in, in those last 10 or 11 verses up from things that Matthew said and Luke said and John said. So it's almost like some later editor was like, this is a horrible way to end the gospel. You can't, I mean, this is a cliff, the ultimate cliffhanger, and you can't stop there. My wife always laughs at me because I have just enough OCD that I have to like finish things. And her favorite thing to do is to, to look at me and go, no, 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 no. And I can't not go, no. Nah. I have to have that last note. It gives me closure. I probably would have been the kind of editor that looked at the original ending of Mark and said, no, 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 no. You can't stop here. So let's cobble together some flashback, or some endings from Mark, from Matthew, Luke, and John. And we'll put that at the conclusion of Mark. Ah, okay, that makes me feel better. I, I, can, I can handle this. But what's interesting about these additions? It, it ends with a final great commission, a lot like Matthew's. And we'll see that in the second half of our lesson. Okay, hold out for that. But mostly what is added is, are these mentions of doubt? I mean, think about it. 9 through 11, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and she went and told them, and they believed not. Or 12 and 13, he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, and they told the others, neither believed they them. And then verse 14, Jesus chastens them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. So the way these later editors probably tried to finish the Gospel of Mark was to put the emphasis on the wrestle between faith and doubt. But ironically, I don't think Mark needed their help to do that. Assuming that scholars are correct and it was a shorter, abrupter ending, I think Mark shoves that question in our face already. Because the way Mark ends according to the shortened version, of the earliest manuscripts stop right there, abrupt as it is. Again, the Greek language changes afterwards. There's all kind of fingerprints all over it that suggest this really was the ending. It, assuming it ended then, then what are we left with as we finish the book of Mark? It's kind of mind-blowing. Look at this. Mark 16, 6 through 8. We've already studied it, but let's just reread it and assume that's the, the, the mic drop at the end of this gospel. He saith unto them, this is the angel speaking to the women that have assembled. We haven't, haven't seen any of these other visitations yet. Just this angel, just the women, just in those early dawn hours, he says to them, be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly, and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Close quote. Close book. Close gospel. That, that's it? And they were afraid? 
No wonder we have to add some, some other passages. Could anybody feel satisfied with that? That's the point. You can't be. Mark has forced the issue upon us, his readers. In that earlier version, Jesus hasn't appeared to anyone yet. We don't have any vertical witnesses. We only have the horizontal testimony of this angel. Will you believe? Oh yeah, there's something to fear, isn't there? Was he right? Is he telling the truth? What will I find when I get to Galilee? Will Jesus be waiting for me? Or will I be disappointed? How will I react to all of these witnesses that have been given and the invitations that are assumed there for me to find out for myself? There's something profound about the abruptness, the startling abruptness of that ending because it forces the issue. How will I respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the promise that Jesus lives, lives again. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Which will I be? It actually makes such perfect sense than the way John ended chapter 20. We still have chapter 21. But the way he ended chapter 20 could have been a final conclusion of his gospel. And in some ways it would have answered the final conclusion of Mark's. This is John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So there's so much we don't have. Oh, I salivate with that. I just, that's like the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. You mean there's more that you didn't write down? Uh, Where can I learn those truths? Well, first you ought to be satisfied with what you do have. (laughs) I mean, read the unsealed portion before you get too anxious about the sealed portion, right? Which is what John hints at in the final verse. But these are written. These 20 magnificent chapters, this account of the gospel is written. It's right here before you. And why have we presented it? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That is the ultimate point of all of this. Gospels are meant to give grounds for belief. It's the good news. Take it or leave it. Believe it or doubt it. But find out for yourself. There's so much more that could be written. I'm glad we do have so much more. I'm grateful that we still have more New Testament to study. I'm grateful for additional scripture in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I'm grateful for living prophets and apostles that continue to bear witness of him. But all of these witnesses have the same purpose in common, and that's that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if we believe that, then we have life because we found it in living places. We found it in a living person, the living Son of God.